Okay, welcome everybody to our June Garden Talk. Uh, today we're having Pamela Moore, a master gardener for several years now. She is my butter monarch butterfly fanatic. This is her actual third talk. Her previous two talks on monarch butterflies are on our YouTube channel, so you can go check them out. But I'm going to hand this over to Pam now. Oh, um, please hold your questions uh, for the end so that we don't interrupt the flow of the talk. And we just so the folks in Zoom know, we also have people here in the office live. So take it away, Pam. All right. Thanks, Jen. So welcome to the people that I can see and welcome to folks on Zoom. I'm glad you were able to take some time today to discuss with us a summer palette of flowers that butterflies like, and particularly monarch butterflies. Um, I've sort of assembled the program. So there's a mix of scientific information, gardening tips, and lots of really pretty shots of monarchs and or flowers. So as Jan said, uh, we'll take questions at the end and we can begin if I can. Okay. Technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. So today's presentation, as Jan already told you, this is part three of a series. Part one was the flight, the plight, and what you can do to help monarch butterflies because they are uh, rapidly declining towards extinction. The second part of it was a fall palette of flowers. And the reason we focused on fall was because the first program was done in the spring and then we were moving towards fall. And in our geographic area, our gardens tend to start waning in late summer and yet the butterflies need the nectar all through the time that they're in our summer wintering grounds. So we focused on fall flowers. And a lot of the fall flowers are native. So if that's of interest to you, uh, look at that on YouTube, as Jan said. And this morning, we're going to talk about the summer palette. And the focus is going to be on summer bloomers, especially the natives. And we want to end that spiral towards extinction of the butterflies. So let me begin with what my inspiration was in my garden journey. And these four photos were my inspiration to plant flowers that attracted monarchs. I became a master gardener because I have an old Victorian house and I wanted to have formal Victorian beds. That was before I met Jan. Jan convinced me through education, it wasn't coercion, through education, that um, I needed to get more background. She roped me into doing helpline. So I immediately started learning more about plant diseases and insects, two things that I really had very little interest in. And I learned that the monarch was headed towards extinction. Well, in my last life, I was an environmental attorney. So it made sense to me that uh, I guess kismet brought me together with Jan because now I've returned back to my roots and I feel that I can take my prior background and add it to my interest in gardening and hopefully make a difference and preserve the monarch butterflies. They're not only beautiful, but they are sort of the canary in the mine for all insects because anything that is affecting the monarchs is probably affecting the other insects and pollinators and it is all tied together. We have a very complex ecosystem and it's all tied together. You take one element out and it's like looking at a jigsaw puzzle where somebody's randomly taken pieces out and then eventually you can't even see what it is and it collapses. So my husband and I were traveling and we were in Mackinac Island and I saw this beautiful garden in a hotel and it had all these butterflies in it. And so that was my inspiration. And I just explained to you what the journey was that I came home and I was just so excited about what I had to do to get monarchs. And I got into the research and I got into the advocacy. Hopefully some of you will get caught by the same bug because we need a lot of people, it's an all hands on deck situation right now. If we are to save the monarch, because the populations, both the Western population, which is west of the Rocky Mountains, and the Eastern population, which is east of the Rocky Mountains, are in severe decline. And any small hiccup in a late storm or more loss of habitat 
could have the effect where they're just not going to be able to come back from it. So it's sort of like somebody that has some medical issues and the medical issues mount up and they end up in ER. And sometimes there's so much going wrong. There's nothing they can do to save the person. It's the same on a larger scale with monarchs. So why native plants? Well, there's lots of reasons for native plants. And probably the most compelling one is that they have a shared evolution. So by having a shared evolution, the insects and the plants sort of help each other. It's a symbiotic relationship. And it's just one part of that delicate balance that we need to maintain for the entire ecosystem. And when that's taken away, things start falling apart. And it's falling apart for the monarchs, but it's falling apart for many other things too. And so we need to become um, more knowledgeable and we need to become better stewards. The other reason you like to use native plants is because they actually provide more nutrients to butterflies and other pollinators than maybe a pretty ornamental will. So it's just like, um, you know, your mother told you you had to eat your spinach because it has iron in it and you preferred M&Ms. So you, you got to kind of mix the two. Um, they often require less water and people are concerned about that for several reasons. And many of our beloved ornamentals are actually crowding out the native plants. And when they crowd out the native plants, that means that the host plants that the butterflies depend on and the monarchs in particular need milkweed as a host plant uh, go away and the nectar plants go away. So if we want to help maintain the balance, then gravitating towards more and more native plants in our gardens, whether it's a container garden, whether it's a garden that you have already and you want to transition to more butterflies, so you're going to be probably transitioning towards more natives, whether it's a community garden you're aware of, um, whether it is just restoration done by landowners, especially rural landowners, all these things play a part and natives are key to this. If you're interested, when you start looking more towards natives, this um, tag here shows that some of the nurseries are now making it very clear what's a native. So when you go to your local nursery, you know, start looking at the tags and they're making the tags and tags more and more helpful. They'll say something like the American Beauty series does say native plants on it. A lot of them now are showing uh, little icons of a butterfly or a bee or probably the circle with a cross in it for deer. So look at your labels and they will help you. It's an evolution. If you're just starting with this, there's a lot of information, but you can just sort of pretend you're a sponge and just soak it up from here and there. And the labels are a good way to start as you're picking new plants. So let's talk about a debate and we'll talk about it early. It relates to the native issue. And the debate is, should we have butterfly bushes in our gardens? And there are many schools of thought on it. Uh, obviously they're beautiful. You can see these two pictures and these are pictures of master gardeners and we, we all love beautiful ornamentals. Um, and it's recently become apparent that they're becoming invasive, more so in areas that have a warmer climate, but they still are listed as invasive in many states. It's growing. And the other side of the coin is they're beautiful and they attract monarchs. So the question is, should I take a butterfly bush out of my garden? Because we get this question every time I give a presentation and on the helpline a lot. And the answer is, it's really your choice. If you have it there and you love it, there's no reason you can't leave it. It is going to bring you joy with the monarchs visiting it. On the other hand, in this particular geographic area, they're not as hardy as they are further south. So it's not a particularly long to live perennial. So when uh, its demise begins, consider replacing it with a native. Uh, and that way you kind of get the, both, the best of both worlds, especially if during that time period, as it may be waning out on its life so, uh, cycle, you start putting in other flowers that will attract the monarch. So you've already sort of got the welcome sign out for them. They're used to coming there and they can then just transition with you and they'll be very happy to find a new native plant in the place of the butterfly bush. 
So let's talk a little bit about some of the scientific things. And for us in Western New York, the flight path for the monarchs is a 3,000 mile flight path. Uh, starts in Upper Canada, some where they some of them over winter. Oh, excuse me, over summer. That's the breeding ground. The breeding ground extends to upstate New York, where we are. But then in the fall, they begin migrating to an area outside of Mexico City, where there are pine trees in one particular area, and they overwinter there. And then, as spring starts to come, new generations are born and new generations then start the flight back. The generation that leaves Mexico is not the generation that will arrive in Western New York. But all along the flight path, whether it's the north-south or the south-north, they need nectar and they need host plants for their caterpillars. So the plight is they're in danger of extinction and there's no doubt about that. The US, um, Fish and Wildlife Service has reviewed a petition to have them put on the endangered species list. Unfortunately, uh, there are so many other things ahead of them that are in more danger. They've merely done a review at this point and they're going to re-review it in another year. So the crunch time is right now because uh, historically and scientifically, species have been identified. They've been petitioned to put on the list for extinction. And by the time the government's ready to act, because there are so many and they triage them, the species actually goes into extinction. We don't want that to happen with the monarch because we love them in our gardens. Uh, they're great science um, models for students that are learning about science and because they are part of that jigsaw puzzle and they're an important piece. Now, one of the real problems is that caterpillars only feed on milkweed. So milkweed is disappearing along the entire 3000 mile flyway. And it's disappearing for a number of reasons, but it really doesn't matter why it's disappearing because it's happening or it's already happened, but yet each of us on the Zoom call today and everyone in this room has the ability to do something about that and that would be to garden differently. And we'll talk about that a little later. There are some glimmers of hope, so I don't want this all to be gloom and doom. Uh, there's an annual survey done every year by uh, the Xerxes Society, and they actually found an increase in their 2021 Thanksgiving count. So that's good, but one year does not make a trend. And at any point in time, if something happens like a particularly cold winter or uh, when they start their flight path back to the north, if uh, there's been a lot of development and there's an area where there's no longer host plants and nectar plants, that could cause a steep decline. So in July of 2022, the International Union for Conservation and Nature designated monarchs as endangered. That is not the federal government, it's an international body, it's well respected, but the real benefit was that it brought a huge amount of publicity to the issue. So in the last year, and we're coming up on the one year anniversary of that, there have been so many articles published, news stories on just general news stations, not even science uh, programs, um, and you go to your nursery, you'll see many more native plants. You will be actually able to buy milkweed at your nurseries now, where when I was a kid growing up in upstate New York, you wouldn't go to a nursery for milkweed. But I'm sorry that I say so too. Okay, so we need to do more and we need to do more while the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is thinking about putting it on the endangered species list. There needs to be more government action and actually uh, several of the federal agencies are working on restoration projects. They are supporting research. Something is being done. But the reason we want the designation is because once it's designated, then there is the authority of the government to actually cause certain things to happen. Uh, Not-for-profits are involved. There's a lot of uh, groups springing up. Uh, Monarch Watch is one of them. We'll talk about that later. So there's a lot of not-for-profit groups. Some of them get government grants. Some of them are university-based, but they are also taking action. As I mentioned, there's a lot of publicity going on. The research is increasing. 
citizens are becoming more active. And one way citizens are active is there are zoning codes in some jurisdictions that say you can't have milkweed. And so that really doesn't make sense if we're trying to restore the habitat for monarchs and all milkweed isn't ugly. And if you're careful about it, you can actually plant milkweed in a suburban garden, which I have, which is right in the village of Churchville, and it doesn't look offensive. Uh, it really bothered my husband when I made him stop the car so I could pick milkweed pods so I could start growing milkweed in our yard because he said, okay, say that again. What is the name of the plant? I said, milkweed. He goes, did you hear the word weed in there? He said, do we not have enough weeds in our yard? See, he's my helper. So he says, do we not have enough weeds in our car, in our yard that I have to stop this card so you can bring weeds home? But then I got to explain to him all the things Janet explained to me and he begrudgingly stopped the car and I planted the milkweed. Um, restoration projects are going on and some of them are being conducted by large landowners because uh, Many of you, if you're from upstate New York, probably remember that, you know, in all the hedgerows, there would be milkweed. Well, then we reversed that and landowners didn't like that anymore, sometimes because they thought it interfered with their production. So again, it's an education process because on my grandfather's old farm, okay, maybe he didn't want the milkweed milked in or the milkweed mixed in with some of his good crops and maybe he didn't want it in the alfalfa, but he had like, the back 40 and maybe a woodlot. And there's no reason. And actually grandpa did love milkweed. Um, he used it for certain medicinal reasons, which I can't talk to you about because Cordell does not adhere to that. But um, he would have had the milkweed and we need to see if we can't get more landowners working on restoration projects. And we need additional gardens. And by additional gardens, I just don't mean uh, if, those of you that are sitting here today have a huge garden. I'm talking about if you're living in a condo, you can get a container and you can build your container garden so that you will have food for the monarchs. And you might even be able to put in one particular kind of milkweed, depending on your exposure and all that. And you could even have milkweed in addition. So let's talk about the life cycle of the monarch because this plays an important part in why there's an uh, issue with the habitat. And basically, um, you can read for yourselves the scientific facts on the uh, metamorphosis and the emergence in about two weeks. But we've got the pictures of the egg, the caterpillar, which is very colorful. And it is colorful because the color signals to predators that it's toxic. So if a predator eats a monarch butterfly caterpillar, it will become very ill, nauseous, sick, and it actually learns not to eat them again. So that's a defense mechanism for them, but many of them still are lost. Uh, they all, most of the eggs, in fact, are not going to make it to the caterpillar stage and then onto the chrysalis. But you know, it's very interesting that nature has been so clever is to develop the coloration of the monarchs such that not only the caterpillars for the monarchs scare away predators, there are several species. And again, let's talk about evolution. So as things evolve, several species have gone through an evolution process where they actually mimic a monarch caterpillar in the way they look as a defense mechanism, even though they don't have the same toxins in their system. Then once the caterpillar eats the leaves of the milkweed and the mother lays the eggs on milkweed, and then the caterpillar will emerge from the egg, they eat all the leaves and actually one caterpillar can pretty much strip the leaves of one milkweed plant. And then when they've eaten enough, then they go off, they form the chrysalis, which um, then leads to the next step in the metamorphosis. And if you look carefully at this, and I'm not sure, well, I don't think Zoom people will see it at all. And I'm not sure the people in this room can see it. I can see it in the photo. You can actually look at the coloration and see the markings of the adult butterfly and the chrysalis. And the closer it gets to 
uh, maturity, the more you can see the orange and black markings. And then finally, it emerges as the butterfly that we all identify with and love. So again, the eggs are laid on the milkweed. Monarch caterpillars only eat milkweed. And on the far left, that is a butterfly milkweed bush. And then we've got two versions of caterpillars here. And the one on the far right, it's a very pretty picture. But the one in the center, you can see where the plant itself isn't all that attractive. So that's why there's the bad rap about, well, you don't want you know anything like that in your garden, it's not attractive. And then beyond that, when the caterpillars start stripping the leaves off, it becomes less attractive. Um, there is an author, he's an entomologist and he's written several books, his name is Doug Tallamy. And he said that he actually rejoices when he sees holes in the leaves of his plants because he knows that he's done his job and he's provided the proper food for, in our uh, instance today, monarchs, but for whatever insect is eating that particular plant. And he goes on in one of his books and explains, and that's nothing to really be panicked about because as you move your landscape from one that may be a typical uh, 20th century American landscape of a whole lot of grass and many ornamentals and maybe just a few natives, it makes sense that What's going to happen is if you've only got a few of the natives around and they need it for their food source, they're going to wipe it out. But if you've moved your garden and your habitat and your community along enough, then you aren't even really going to notice that 20% of the leaves are gone of something. So again, part of it's just we need more education and we need a slightly different mindset. So is the glass half empty or is the glass half full? For him, if he sees that the leaves are being stripped away and he sees holes, he's happy. Other people, he admits in his book, will run for the nearest can of pesticide spray. And he said, that's another thing we need to move away from. So basically, no, and I'm harping on this because really the milkweed is the backbone of the restoration and our efforts to save the monarch. So no milkweed, no monarchs. And they deserve more love, respect, and understanding. They are both a host plant. That's where the mother lays the eggs. The caterpillars eat them. But while they're in bloom, they also serve as a nectar plant for the monarch butterfly. And pictured here are the five most typical types of milkweed in order of preference by the butterflies in upstate New York. So on the left, the common milkweed, and that's what you've probably seen on the roadsides. The swamp milkweed, which by its name uh, prefers a slightly more damp environment. I've even read that um, if you're going to do a container garden, swamp milkweed will exist in a container garden. All you have to do is make sure that you keep the container garden moist and you need to put in other plants that also like to be moist. Because whenever you're doing a container garden, you want to make sure that the same water requirements uh, match up in that container, or you're going to have some very happy plants and some very unhappy plants. In the center is the butterfly weed milkweed. This is the one that fits in the urban or suburban garden and is just beautiful. It mounds up. It has beautiful little flowers on it. After the flowers mature, you begin to see tiny pods developing. And by fall, you actually see pods. And I was out in my garden and I was kneeling down and two ladies were walking by on the sidewalk and they looked at it and one said, that looks like milkweed, but it can't be milkweed. So I popped up and said, yes, it is milkweed. It's a variety of milkweed and it's very good for you know a suburban setting like this. So um, people aren't aware of that one as much. It's gaining popularity. So if you go to any of the local nurseries, that's one that you'll easily see. The next one is the world milkweed. Now, personally, I have tried to grow this and I haven't been as successful. So I'm not exactly sure why. Um, but that also is an upstate New York milkweed. And finally, the last one is the poke milkweed. And you can see that they kind of vary in you know, what the flowers look like and uh, the coloration. And it's something that if 
I was telling somebody to start out with, I would steer them towards the butterfly weed, milkweed, unless they um, are brave like me and they just want to go out in the country and get some common milkweed seeds and see if you can start the common milkweed and work it into your garden. And by working into your garden, I mean, um, they've done studies and you need to plant the host plants near the nectar plants. And if you do, then the percentage of butterflies that will visit goes up exponentially. So if you do that and you've got your nectar plants, you're planting near your milkweed, which is your host plant, uh, and you can start to think about things like height and when you want to have something covered up. So put something that's tall enough in front of the common milkweed that if its leaves get stripped, that's not what you're looking at. You've got something in front of it. So that's what I mean that if you put a little bit of thought in it and it's a trial and error thing and it's a transition and it's an evolution and everything's not gonna be successful. And uh, it takes patience and time. When I decided I was going to make the garden along my sidewalk, a pollinator bed, my neighbor came over and offered to weed whack everything because it looks so bad. <laughs> and I said to him, no, no, Lou, it's it's going to be fine. I'm putting in this pollinator bed here and this is the first year. And, you know, with perennials, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, the third year they leap. He's like, yeah, well, you know, are you sure you just don't want me to just weed whack this whole thing down? And I'm like, no. So three years go by, comes across the street and he goes, okay, you were right. It looks really nice. He said, but I would have weed whacked it all. And I said, oh yeah, I know that. <laughs> so, you know, that's the other thing. If you're going to do it in an urban suburban setting, you need to talk to your neighbors, especially when they start expressing concern. Because if you're living next to Mr. or Ms. Neat Nut, and everything is like, you know, manicured and they're out there on their hands and knees along the sidewalk, making sure the grass is perfect. They are going to totally have a meltdown over what you're doing unless they understand what you're doing. And then you can bring them a lot. So um, it's, it's, and they may even start making changes. My husband and I were walking along the sidewalk two summers ago and he said, do you notice that a lot of the stuff that you've got in your bed is now popping up in other yards? And it's not because they're coming and stealing my plants at night, but they kind of like the idea. So, and, and every time I divide, of course, master gardeners, we run galas here twice a year and we all dig from our gardens and bring our plants here for uh, the public to purchase. But um, I not only dig for our galas, I will dig for anybody that wants to take any of the plants and you know start their own little science experiment in their yard and talk to their friends and neighbors. So again, the monarchs are gonna need their nectar from June, so that's right about now. So that's why we're talking about it now, all the way through mid fall. And, you know, if you go all the way over to the right here, you will see something that many people identify as a weed. Well, maybe, maybe we need to redefine what we talk about when we call something a weed, uh, because this is absolutely beautiful. And I've been in formal gardens where they have featured a piece of goldenrod like this in the center. And in one of my other presentations, I actually have the picture where we've got in the center, this goldenrod and it's gorgeous and it's just so striking. And then we look at the picture without the goldenrod there and it's pretty, but it doesn't have the same pop. So, you know, why do we have to be pejorative and call it a weed and say, we've got to dig it out? Um, I'm not saying that you'd want your entire yard like this, and I'm not saying that your neighbors would like it if you turned your entire yard into this, but again, there are different varieties of this plant, and you can look for size, you can look for bloom time, and it's one of the great ones to extend the bloom into the fall for the nectar that they need in the fall as they're preparing to start the first leg of their journey to the south for their overwintering in Mexico. So what are the elements of a welcoming habitat? Okay, the first one is milkweed. Probably surprised to hear me say milkweed, right? Uh, then drifts of nectar. And you can see this drift. This is Jerusalem artichoke. This is my yard. And this is one of my September flowers. And 
I just love it. My neighbor didn't love it when he first saw me put it in, but uh, he had to admit it was beautiful. Establish a pesticide free zone. And if you have, uh, you know, beautiful roses and you feel you just can't wean yourself away from the pesticides because of the roses, well, then at least cordon off the area where you're putting in the habitat for the monarchs and, you know, do not use pesticides in that area. And again, we have to be realistic. It's what you want your garden to be. Um, I obviously advocate little to no pesticide use, but I understand that people have different tastes and some people are going to want to continue to use it and that's fine. But I'm just saying that if you're going to establish a habitat for the monarchs, then that's something that you need to consider and be willing to uh, take into account and maybe just ease off or stop using altogether. They also need shelter because uh, the slide where we showed their migration, they can only fly when it's dry and it's above 55 degrees. So if it's rainy and below 55 degrees, they need somewhere to shelter and be safe during the day. And they it also at night, they need shelter. They need water. They need uh, enzymes, especially the males during the mating season. So a butterfly puddler, and we do have a brochure available about how to make a butterfly puddler, but a butterfly puddler provides those additional enzymes and nutrients that particularly the males need. And uh, again, because they fly when it's 55 degrees and it's dry, if it's a little damp, if there's been a little bit of fog, if it's a little cool, they will start coming out in the morning. And what they look for is somewhere where they can warm up. So they look for a nice stone to just light on and it's a warming stone for them. So just, you know, an additional element in your garden that you can use for decorative purposes would be a stone with flowers around it so they can warm up there. And then as they get warm, then they can start to flitter away and they can go to the nectar plants. And the added bonus of having a monarch friendly uh, habitat is they bring their friends. So this is the butterfly weed milkweed and we have a bee on it. And um, this is another butterfly that I had never seen before in my yard and still I started putting the plants in for the monarch. So I decided, oh, this is pretty good. Um, and then I was in Canada and I was walking through a museum garden and I couldn't figure out they had just rows and rows of parsley. And so I'm like, well, that's kind of odd. But then they had other native plants in that garden. And I thought, okay, they must be trying to do something here because there's all these native plants and then there's all this parsley. Well, come to find out, I didn't know it. And this is what I mean about being a master gardener. You're a lifelong learner and you get into science, whether you think you're going to or not. And um, I learned that particular butterfly species like parsley. They like parsley, they like dill. They like Queen Anne's lace. I have an abundance of Queen Anne's lace in my yard that was just uh, distributed by the birds. So that's probably why I have this butterfly. Um, and this year I'm gonna add a lot more parsley because I really like this little guest. So what kind of flowers attract monarchs? Well, there's certain things that attract them, but the list is not exclusive. So they like the natives because it's the best source of energy. They like particular colors and it's sort of the red spectrum. It's the red, the purple, the pink, and the orange. They like a flat top so they can land on it. They like drifts of the same color and that sort of catches their eye the same way when we're going somewhere. And if, in, especially in the spring where there's a huge drift of daffodils, that'll catch us, our eyes much more than just one little daffodil plant. But there are exceptions and here's an exception. Here's a uh, monarch on a white hydrangea. So it's, you know, doesn't fulfill the criteria, but they will go to other things. Um, and is again, going back to the plant tag, here's the plant tag for the baby Joe, Joe pie plant. And again, it says native on it, and that's gonna provide a lot of energy and a lot of fall energy to the monarchs because they go for the nectar of that. And it's a very nice, pinkish color, pinkish uh, mauve color, which they like. So add the puddler and here's a picture of a puddler. Jan actually made this, uh, the leaf that you see here. And 
the uh, composition of the puddler is just sea sand, compost, and you dampen it. And the male butterflies, that it shouldn't be wet like a bird bath. It should just be damp enough. And they're able to go to it and they feed on it and they take those enzymes. And I've got it surrounded. So it's a nice decorative element. It's surrounded with things that the monarchs like. The orange in the middle is the butterfly weed milkweed. And then uh, Leatris is there. Sedum is there. Ma, let's see. Marigolds are there, good annual, all-time color. Uh, lots of weeds are there, some daylilies, and the Queen Anne's Lace. So we, we mix it all in. And the Butterfly Puddler is a very easy project to do with children. So if you're looking for a project to do with children, and it doesn't have to be anything as beautiful as this, it can be a clay saucer. So for kids, if you just wanna do it in a clay saucer, uh, that's fine. Uh, butterflies really don't care. They're going for what's in it and not what it's in. So we need to provide shelter for them. So on the left-hand side is the shelter that's just natural in my garden. And on the right-hand side is the additional shelter that I'm adding with the red twig dogwood that has, it's called pucker up and it has puckered leaves. So again, um, you can be as creative as you want. So I kind of gravitate more towards you know, unusual, and I was probably somebody who was putting in a lot of uh, non-native ornamentals. So I'm sort of taking care of my fix for that by finding native plants that fit my uh, vibe for artistic elements in the garden. So when I saw the leaves on this, even though I didn't need one more bush, I just couldn't seem to walk away. So here's the other thing you can do. If you want to have the perennials that you have for the monarchs go into fall because you have limited space for this monarch garden that you're putting together, you can do that by actually going in in midsummer doing some deadheading. It's really boring, but I did it last year and it really does work. I read about it and went, oh yeah, that probably doesn't work anyways because I really didn't want to do the work. So I thought, okay, we're going to try it with one plant. So I went out and I deadheaded this plant. You can see the pile of um, blossoms that are spent that I've got there. And I did finally take them away, but I wanted them for the picture. And it did bloom again in the fall. It provided the nectar that the butterflies needed. And uh, as I did that, I sort of thought, oh, I can probably deadhead those marigolds behind it. And I did that. And then as I'm doing that, sometimes you'll break off a good flower. And I'm like, oh, wait, instant gratification and reward. So I'm going to bring out a glass of water or a little mason jar. And as I'm deadheading, I'm going to pick myself a bouquet. And then I take it in and I put it on my dining room table. And it's like, you know, I have all this beauty. All my hard work was actually, you know, I can instantly see it. I don't have to wait until the next buds come and it blooms again. Just a little trick. Um, I'm big on instant gratification for gardens. So if, um, I'm talking about it it's because I don't want to discourage people because it is a process. And if you decide to do this, you can do it one of two ways. You can go whole hog and you can just take an area that's bare and you can start in or you can transition or you can do both, which I have chosen to do uh, because I need some instant gratification. So let's talk about how these plants that are summer blooming plants fit into different types of gardens. Well, here we have private urban gardens and you can see Lovely, lovely butterflies and totally different treatment of how they've put them in. One is near a deck. One appears to be uh, maybe also near a deck because it looks like there's some mesh there. And then the one that Jan took on the left was in Buffalo. And the person actually does have, in addition to some hosta in here, there is some milkweed in the garden. And it's very attractive. And they've added their idea of artistic flair, and there's a little welcome sign that's a monarch. Private suburban garden. This is my garden again, and it's got the puddler in it, and it's got a variety of different things. And you can see, if you look closely, hopefully the Zoom people can see it. I think the folks here in the room can see it. Uh, directly above the puddler, 
you can see the first of the pods coming out on the butterfly weed, milkweed, and then behind them, the little orange spots you can see are the blooms of that plant. So it's sort of moving towards late summer. It's still blooming a little, but the pods have emerged for the ones that bloomed in the beginning. So again, as you're just walking down my sidewalk and you're looking, you don't look at that and go, oh, they have milkweed in their front yard. Uh, no, instead they see this beautiful plant and if they're looking carefully, they see pods and then they start asking questions. So again, it's perfect for the urban suburban setting and here's just a different iteration of it. Here are some private rural gardens. So again, you see very things that are very colorful. I think you can see in the picture on the far left that is Jan's garden and you will see that she's successfully and artistically worked goldenrod into the back of that garden. Maybe I didn't work it in, but it's there. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's the other good thing. Yeah, Mother Nature helps us out a lot, and that's okay, too. That's the other rule I have is that anything in my front pollinator garden, uh, with the exception if I know that there's going to be a real dry spell and, um, or, and I'm going away, that garden does not get watered. I just let Mother Nature take care of it. And that's good because when I do have to water it, when we have a really dry spell or when I'm going away for vacation and I don't want to impose on my friends too much, um, watering it, given the size it is, has become a real chore. So uh, not having to continuously every day water it like the fancy baskets that I used to have where twice a day, if you had a fuchsia, you're out there watering it. Uh, not the same issue at all. And then we've got public, commercial, and community gardens, and we go the range from a resort property uh, hotel in Mackinac. I wasn't staying in the resort property. We just walked by it. Uh, but from uh, the resort property on Mackinac Island to a parking lot in Lockport. And that's part of the beauty of it. If we start all working together, we're going to build that network. And then for that flyway, there will be host plants and nectar plants all the way along. In rural spaces, now this is beautiful. I, I again, stop the car, stop the car. Uh, and this is just a farm field near Letchworth. And you know, how much more beautiful could this be? This beautiful drift. And we used to see all these all the time and it's disappearing. Uh, some of it is because the landowner doesn't want this type of plant here anymore. Some of it's because we are developing and putting in housing. Um, a variety of reasons. Some of it is the highway departments think that anything, you know, that's more than two inches tall ought to be just mowed flat. Doesn't matter if it's in bloom. Doesn't matter if it's providing a purpose. So uh, we need more restoration projects. So both municipal, so like highway crews, uh, community parks, but also individual landowners and some of the not-for-profits that really are doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the research and the science for preservation of monarchs are actually partnering with large organizations that represent landowners. Many times they're, they're farmers or ranchers and um, they're forming, instead of an adversarial relationship, a cooperative relationship where they're explaining, they're educating, they're saying, could we try this? And a lot of times, if, if you're a farmer, you love nature. You couldn't do that job if you didn't love nature and you didn't love uh, beauty. So it may not be something that was on the radar screen of a particular rancher or a farmer, but you know, if approached in a non-adversarial way, and you know, giving them an opportunity to do more for stewardship and you know, what job has more stewardship in it, except maybe the clergy than farmers, um, you know, many of them will opt into it. So that's a thing that we need to concentrate on. If any of you are interested, there's plenty of uh, groups. And at the end, there's a resource list and you can see some of these groups. You can do research yourselves and you can uh, learn more and you can become more of an advocate in your own community. Everybody's not willing to be an advocate. Um, 
that's my job being an advocate. So I'm real comfortable with it. I love mixing it up. Um, everybody's not the same. That's probably good. Um, but we really need to think more about the necessity and the benefits that these weeds provide. And maybe we need to stop uh, even using the word weeds. And I have noticed that in some magazines that things that you know years ago would be called weeds, they're now substituting the Latin name. And I, I think it's by design because they figure if they tell people the Latin name and they get them to like it, if they later find out that the common name has the word weed in it, it doesn't bother them as much. <laughs> Uh, ways to educate and reform. Like everybody isn't going to be an out there advocate, but there are ways you could be a quiet advocate. So Jan has in her yard this pollinator habitat sign, which educates people that her garden, this beautiful garden, is a pollinator habitat. And who wouldn't gravitate towards that and want to know more about it if you really like butterflies and if you really like monarchs and if you really like flowers? Um, Another way to do it is this is the sign that Monarch uh, Watch has, and it has more information on it. It's more of a technical scientific sign, and it just explains a little more about it. Um, you, you can use both. You can use neither. Uh, but it's another way to do a soft education and inform people. I've put the guidelines for creating a Monarch way station on this slide. And the reason I did was um, I don't anticipate most of you are going to establish a Monarch way station and that's just fine, but their guidelines really are the recipe for how you can create a successful Monarch butterfly habitat. So if you look at these and you have, you know, like um, beginner's knowledge, this is almost step-by-step -step recipe of what things you need to start thinking about in order to either transition a garden you have or establish a garden. So minimum size, 100 square feet, that sounds like a lot until you think about it in the way I've done it. It's along my sidewalk, so it's 200 feet. So, okay, so 100 square feet, 200 feet, I've already you know, gone way over. Your sun exposure, that's for any garden you're gonna put in. You need to think about your sun exposure, right plant, right place. You need good drainage. Uh, you need to know what your soil type is. We do free soil type. Well, no. At the gala, we do free soil type testing. Correct, Dan? pH. pH. Sorry. Um, and you need to know your soil type, and it would be helpful if you knew your pH, too, as you're going out and buying plants. So you need shelter, you need milkweed, you need the nectar plants, you need to figure out a management plan because some people have tried to promote natives by saying, oh, no maintenance with natives. Well, that's not true. Every plant has maintenance. It may be a lower degree of maintenance. For example, I said, I don't uh, water my bed unless you know it's dire circumstances, but it still needs water. I've gone out and seen in a very hot, dry period, my black-eyed Susans just kind of you know bent right over. So uh, there is maintenance. And if you want to avail yourself of the opportunity, you can actually apply for certification. So I did, I applied for certification, my Esperanza garden. In Spanish, the word Esperanza is translated to English as hope. So this is my hope that we can save the monarch. Um, and I'm way station number 37,887. And that was a year ago. So the numbers are growing. Um, and my little friend, daughter of a friend of mine is out there helping me water and um, just sort of serving as a nice little model for you know, what you can create in an urban environment, but still have your milkweed. And I think she's actually watering my, one of my early milkweeds there. So summer bloomers, I'm just gonna quickly go through this, but this is just uh, for the people that just like pictures of pretty flowers and butterflies. And just to give you some ideas of some of the plants that you could sort of, if you wanna transition or begin a monarch garden, um, these are good backbone plants. So Coreopsis, and there's actually two types. There's a perennial and there's an annual. So you can look into either of those. They're very, very hardy and the monarchs love them and they actually grow quickly. So if you put them in uh, year one, 
by year two, uh, you have a huge plant. Cosmos, the echinacea, the coneflower, the liatris, monarchs particularly love this. And um, it's often seen in floral arrangements. So it's one that you can put into your garden and if you want it more on the formal end, you can easily put this in and then it gives it that more formal vibe. The mandara, also the known as bee balm. Flocks and here, this is all from my garden and it just shows you that they need to have something from mid-June to fall. And here we start with June with the mini pearl. August, we've got the coral, the deep coral. And then in September is the lilac with the white center. All flocks, all in that garden. The rose, black-eyed Susan we're all familiar with. Sedum or stone crop. This one I particularly like because it transitions over time. So the upper left there, you can see the blossom and it's all green. And then midsummer, it's starting to take on a little bit of color and a cast to it. And then in full bloom and it's full glory uh, because it's called Autumn Joy in the fall. Clover, and you can see the bee on it. So the benefit of annuals, why do you wanna add some annuals in? Because I showed you all the perennials, which would be your cornerstone plants. Well, you can test your colors and test your locations. So here we see uh, the spider plant and the Cosmo contrasted with the daylily. Something like a marigold, it's a constant bloomer. You can buy it before Memorial Day. If you're a risk taker, you can plant it before Memorial Day as opposed to keep it on your porch and you'll have it through frost. And then the two pictures on the bottom, the one on the left, that is actually butterfly weed that I got last spring and it was three inches tall. This is what it looked like midsummer. And this is one that I put in uh, three years ago. So you can see how in a short amount of time, it really expands in size. And it's nice to have marigolds and zinnias and cosmos because you can kind of plant around them. And then as the next year, you have to buy and plant fewer annuals because you have less space because it's been taken up by the perennials you put in. Um, other annuals, the Cleome and the spider flower, I like that because it's tall, it self seeds, it's very dramatic, and it's a nice background plant. I already mentioned marigolds, the Mexican sunflower, and this is a garden um, the University of Wisconsin has in, and you can see all the different plants and then how, again, I was talking about how you can use height so you easily could mix in there. I don't see where they have, but you could easily mix in there some common or swamp milkweed, depending on the uh, dampness of the area. And with the Mexican sunflower there and the other plants you've got there, it would kind of just be part of the background and it would not be offensive if somebody wants a more formal look. Salvia, uh, you can get them everywhere, lots of different varieties and the monarchs just love them. Uh, again, zinnia is much the same, easy to grow. They come from dwarf to very tall, you know, lots of colors, but, you know, the monarchs do like the red family. So that's what you see here. Um, this is just my late summer garden. So here is a list of things that were in bloom on August 29th of 22. And it's really quite an extensive list. And then when I did my program of the fall palette, I did a similar list. And actually many of the things in this list were still in my garden, you know, October-ish, mid-October, but they were also there for the end of August. So um, I actually think that my goldenrod started blooming in mid-August last year. So that's kind of a, depending on the variety you choose, you can have that from early, early all the way to late fall. So here's the list of where um, you can find native plants. By no means is it a comprehensive list, but if you want to start uh, going on day trips and you want to empty your wallet quickly uh, <laughs> and you want to fill the back of your car quickly, these are all wonderful places you can visit.
references and resources. Again, um, I think my two favorites are the uh, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center website and the Missouri Botanical Garden for finding a plant and finding out about a plant. And then if you want more technical scientific information about the monarchs and their plight, the Monarch Watch site is an excellent one. And um, a lot of the, the books are good reference books too. They're by no means the only ones. And uh, then we are a resource for you. We have a helpline. It operates daily. Um, from nine to 12, 10 to 12. Oh, I'm, I haven't been here in a while, so uh, I'm sorry. Um, we have articles we've published. We've got brochures available on how to make a butterfly puddler, how to create a wildlife habitat in your own backyard. The YouTube channel is available and there's different playlists within it. And I would just like to end by saying that if any of you, um, found this interesting. There are from time to time uh, classes available for you to become a master gardener. I actually did that several years ago. It was my glide path towards retirement. And uh, instead of being a glide path towards retirement, I'm working more hours than ever because I've upped my real job hours because I have fewer headaches. And I have a beautiful garden. So, you know, it's a win-win. Uh, the Fellow master gardeners are wonderful people. They like people, they like plants, they're lifelong learners. It's a great place to volunteer if you're looking for volunteer opportunities. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to get involved with if you have any inclination at all. Jan is the person you would talk to about that. And I would like to just give Jan a special thanks for all the help getting me interested in this, the help with all the programs. And many of the photos that you saw today were from Jan's garden, my garden, and a number of other master gardeners shared their pictures as well. So with that, if there are questions, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Yes. Sure. First, I wanted to mention that if you're buying milkweed in the nursery, make sure you ask them if they've been sprayed. Because That's a good point. They do sometimes spray their plants unknowingly that they have little children to cure their folks. Also, um, I think every part of the milkweed is poisonous to pets. So if you're planting them, I got them out my my dad's dad. My dog doesn't have them. But some dogs do like to chew on plants. I think it's a caution. Okay, and thanks. I also want to mention if anybody needs milkweed seeds, I got hands on. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, milkweed. All right. And ma'am, you had a question? You mentioned an author, and I could not understand the name of the author. I bet it was Doug Tallamy. Could, could yeah. you spell that? No, but Jan can. Okay. <laughs> yep, it's T A L L A M Y. Sorry, Doug, if I got it wrong, but I think that's it. Any questions from our Zoom folks? You can either put it in the chat or um, you can unmute. And while we're waiting, I would like to thank Pam. This is great. So this is the third one of her programs and we will have this up on a, our YouTube page also soon. Jan, it says three chats on um, my screen. I'm not seeing any new, hang on. Yes. Have you been to the Brockport Visitor Center? Not in years. If you type it in, I believe that they do have uh, a friendly garden there. Great. For pollinators. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful to use the entire Erie Canal that way? Oh, I love you. <laughs> Advocate. Oh. A kindred spirit. Oh, that's great. I've been trying to get it in my town. And in, oh, I did say where I live. Um, sorry about that. Uh, well, they need to get with the program. What can I tell you? Uh, I think that's a great idea. And some people have talked about doing it along uh, like super highways, like I-90 and that. And there's a little issue with that because if you do all the planting along there, then if one of the things that is noted in the scientific literature about the demise of the monarchs is being hit by cars. 
and that they found in general during COVID that insects populations of some insects, especially in your urban areas went up because there weren't so many commuters. So, but the Erie Canal is a, uh, is a byway sounds great to me. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so Deb did have a question. What is the timing of the egg laying and hatching for the monarch in our area? For the caterpillars, the butterflies. Well, they, they start soon after they arrive in. So when do they June. arrive in Western New York? Like now time frame. Right now, right. That's why the, the, the June flowers, like the marigolds and that sort of thing with the annuals, because a lot of our perennials that they would gravitate towards, because, you know, right now we're looking at iris and peonies, but that's nothing that they're attractive to. So like the flat top marigolds would be a good one to have now and right about now. It depends on the year. It fluctuates. And I think it's on the Monarch Watch site where they actually have people uh, volunteer to report when they're seeing the first monarchs in their area. And I think you can track it that way too. Any other questions? I know we're past an hour, so I'd like to wrap it up. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for attending today. And we're skipping July. So we'll see you back in August for our next garden talk. <laughs>